Okay, part five. So here we are, part five, introduction to mass spectrometry for analytical biochemistry. Hopefully you haven't uh, sat through all of these in one hit. If you have, congratulations. Um, we used to do this as an entire two hour lecture um, and it was pretty hard work. Um, so if you haven't had a break after the first four and got yourself a cup of coffee, you know, hit pause now and go back, get yourself a coffee or get yourself a whiskey or whatever you need. And um, we'll move on to start to talk about how we can actually use mass spectrometry to answer some biological questions. Before I go on, uh, I'll talk again about the fact that we use these things every day in our proteomics core facility. We measure lipids, we measure metabolites, we measure proteins, we measure peptides, and we do this using these two instruments that we have in the lab, mainly for biomolecules. We do have a number of others, but these are our two main workhorse instruments. Our water's Synapse system, which is about six months old, and our Thermo Q Exactive Plus system, which is getting on to about three years, but is still a pretty powerful, robust instrument. So, I've gone on a lot about how we measure the mass of biomolecules and how we can do this and how mass spectrometers work and how we can use them to separate molecules. But what we want to do now is talk about what, why is this important? What is the point of all of this? So the first thing that I want to get across is that the unique chemical structure of a molecule gives it a unique mass that can be diagnostic of the molecule. Now, we're going to talk a lot about proteins and peptides because um, that's the majority of my background and it tends to make things a little bit simpler, simpler to understand. So, um, when mass spectrometry with proteomics started back in the late 90s, um, uh, fragmentation really wasn't a thing. So what people would do is they would take their proteins, they would separate them out by gel electrophoresis or 2D gel electrophoresis. They would cut proteins out and they would digest them with trypsin. And what that would do is it would create peptides. So you can actually get the sequence of a protein, in this case, horse heart myoglobin, and you can theoretically digest it with trypsin. And here are the peptides that you would get. And because we know all of the mass of all of the elements, we can calculate the mass of the peptide. And so um, what we can then do is we can fly these things originally in a maldi toff mass spectrometer where we get these intact peptide masses. And you could compare the two things over. So what you can see here is that there's a mass here at 1,606. That corresponds to this peptide. There's um, a mass down here at 1,502. That corresponds to this peptide. Um, what else? I'm trying to find a few of the others. 1,271 is down there. And so what you can do is um, match these theoretical masses from the sequence against your data, and whichever one fits the best, it's most likely to be that protein. Now, the problem with that is what happens if you have a molecule that is isobaric? So, um, and this can happen quite regularly, um, especially in a complex mixture of peptides where you can have you know, 5,000, 10,000 different protein species or proteiforms, and you digest them up with trypsin, it's not a big leap of logic to realize that a number of those peptides are going to have pretty close or the exact mass as another one. So as an example, what I've done here is this is the sequence of glufibrinopeptide, which is one of the most analyzed peptides in mass spectrometry because everyone uses it as a calibration standard. Um, so this is the sequence, and it has a calculated mass um, of about 1570. If I take this sequence and I reverse it, I get exactly the same mass. But because I've reversed it, 
it is very, very likely that these peptides will have different functions. They will interact with other proteins differently. They'll interact in it with their environment differently. It, it's, um, it's very easy to change the function of a peptide by doing something like this. So if I put these both into the mass spectrometer, I would get one peak. I would not be able to tell the difference between these two molecules. So measuring the intact mass of something doesn't necessarily reveal that it has any isomers. Now, if I, you, if I break these into smaller pieces and measure their masses, I can start to differentiate between two things. So these are the same peptides that we saw in the uh, previous slide, where this is glufibrinopeptide, and we've broken the, it through this bond. This is the reverse. We've broken it through the same bond. And what we find is we've created two fragments with different masses. And now we can tell the difference between these two things because these, these fragments are unique to these sequences being broken through here. So if I take that logic and extend it on, um, you'll see how we can start to sequence peptides. What I've just described is doing tandem MS, where you're doing one round of mass spectrometry to measure the mass of the intact molecule and a second round of mass spectrometry to measure the mass of the fragments. The most common way of doing this is what's called collision-induced dissociation. And you see this in triple quads and tandem quads, in quadrupole time of flight instruments, in iron traps where it's considered to be tandem in time, or tandem time of flight instruments where um, you uh, separate the ions by time of flight into a collision cell and then fragment them. We're not going to talk about this too much. But there are other ways of doing this. Electron capture dissociation is one way of doing this, and we can do this in ion cyclotrons and, and some orbitrap instruments, and also electron transfer dissociation. We're not going to spend a heck of a lot of time on these two things, just to let you guys know that these are a regular way of fragmenting biomolecules. So this is a video from uh, Agilent, and what it's going to show as soon as it starts, whoops, my apologies. So what we can see here is that we've got this big collection of ions that are coming through and this is the first quadrupole and what it's doing is it's only selecting the green ions, whatever mass that they are. All of those ions will be the same mass and so the quadrupole is set that everything else has been spat out. We've talked about this before. What's happening in here is that those molecules are colliding with nitrogen gas molecules. They're accelerated into the collision cell. They collide with those molecules and they are then fragmented. And those fragments then get carried um, out into the rest of the instrument where they end up in either the time of flight detector or they end up in the orbit trap where the fragment masses are measured. So what the mass spectrometer is continuously doing is it's doing um, this where it does a complete scan of the mass range. It selects one of those ions for fragmentation. It fragments it, and then it measures the mass of the fragments. Typically, what it will do is it will do that for all of the ones in an MS1 scan before doing another MS1 scan where it selects the di a different most intense one that wasn't selected in the previous cycle and you get that. And it just keeps going and going and going until it gets to the end of the cycle. So the fragments that are produced are dependent on a number of different things. So the way that a peptide especially can fragment depends on its composition, it depends on its size, 
and it also depends on the way that it is uh, that energy is put into it to get it to fragment. Whether that's by beam CID, like in a quadrupole TOF, or um, another way, like in a high energy collision cell. It also depends on the charge state of the peptide. Um, so you'll get different fragmentation or different intensities of different fragments if they're 2 plus or 3 plus or 4 plus. These are relatively low energy collisions and they typically cause fragmentation down the amide bond, which is the bond between sequential amino acids. If you crank up the collision energy, you can get side chain fragmentation, which can give you more information, such as trying to differentiate between leucine and isoleucine, which are isobaric and can't be differentiated in low energy uh, collisions. But if you do a higher energy, you can break those side chains off to be able to tell which one is which. But that creates increasingly complex spectra. So this is the nomenclature that we use for describing uh, the sequence of a peptide from mass spectrometry. And the main one that you should remember is when you get cleavage through this amide bond here, this is the first amino acid in the sequence where you've got the N-terminal amine, which become this will become protonated in acid conditions. And then this is the side chain of the first amino acid, the carboxyl group, and then you join it to the next amino acid. So you fragment down this bond. If the charge is carried on to this end of the peptide, it creates what's called a B ion. If the charge is carried on this end of the peptide, it's called a Y ion. Now, normally when you digest things with trypsin, the very end amino acid is going to be lysine or arginine, and it will be charged. So in um, electrospray with tryptic peptides, you tend to generate a Y series rather than a B series. You do get them, but they're not as intense. So I'm going to take you through how this works um, a couple of times just to make sure we hammer the point home. So in our MS1 scan, our intact peptides, we have our C12 and our C13 isotope. There's a half a Dalton difference between these two things, so we know that this is a peptide. We can use that to select this for fragmentation because if it was singly charged, it's not likely to be a peptide. We don't care about singly charged molecules. So we select all of the C12 molecules and we send them to the collision cell and we collide them. And so by doing that, we end up with something that looks like this. And the same peptide fragmented in the same instrument will give you the same pattern of intensity every time. Um, and it's, it's a handy thing to know because in data independent acquisition, one of the things that you can use for library matching and to make sure that you're confident of the peptide identification is does the um, intensity, not just the fragment masses, line up? Sometimes it doesn't, it just depends. Um, but they're normally pretty close to the mark. So what we're seeing here is, um, in this case, a collection of larger and larger Y ions. And so we start with the smallest one here, where we can find down here an iron at 175.1, and that is the mass of arginine. So if we fragment the peptide sequence and we fragment it through here, we should get a mass of this. And that's what we see. Um, I'll come back to de novo sequencing uh, in, a, uh, in a few slides time. But what you can see is that the fragment's getting larger and larger. So here we have arginine, uh, alanine and arginine, and then serine, alanine and arginine, and it gets larger and larger. So we go from here to here. This is a B ion in particular. This one is B4, um, B5. Larger iron, There's this is actually misplaced. This uh, should be sitting over here above 627. Um, glycine, so on. And so you can see that you end up with this ladder of fragments that is reflective of the amino acid sequence. Now, I'm going to go through this, um, which I have borrowed from uh, Karen Johnshire. Um, and 
uh, I'll put the link to the entire presentation because there's a really neat guide that goes with all of this. But it's a really good way of showing how you can interpret an MSMS spectrum to be able to work out the sequence of a peptide. Now, in this particular case, uh, the, the, the observed peptide was doubly charged. And when you take that into account, the mass of the intact peptide is this. So what we're going to do is we're going to look for fragments from this mass that could reflect the sequence. And so glycine is the smallest amino acid at 57. Tryptophan is the largest at 186. If we look in this range, we want to find ions in this range below the precursor to find the first amino acid fragment, the first one missing a fragment. Whoops. Okay, so here's our spectrum. So if we look at this one at 1337, if we take 1450 and we minus 1337, we get the mass of leucine or isoleucine. We can't tell the difference. If we look at the next one down, um, 1276, so we go 1450 minus 18 minus 1276, we get the mass of arginine. Um, I'll come back to why the 18 is important uh, later on. The next one down at 1238, that's too close. That can't be part of this series. Um, so what we have now is we've got the amino acid, a fragment for the first amino acid and a fragment for the last amino acid. And we know that this should have been lysine or arginine. So we know that this 1276, being the mass of arginine below the parent, this has got to be the C-terminal fragment. This one has to be because um, it's a triptych peptide. This should be the last amino acid. If we go to the, um, the next one down at 1238, 1337 minus 1238, we get the mass of valine. So now we're starting to build a series. If we go from 1276 to 1219, that's the mass of glycine. It's too close to 1238, so it can't be that one. And if we start working our way through to do the subtractions, we can start to assign the peptide sequence. Um, because, as I said, the reason that we can tell that this is part of this series and not this series is because the mass difference between this and this is less than 57. And it has to be 57 or higher to be the mass of an amino acid. The thing that you'll notice and the thing that I didn't point out up until this point is that you get a series of ions from both ends of the peptide. You don't get a single series working through from the N-terminal to the C-terminal. You get a series of ions from both ends of the molecule, and they should complement each other. This is very different to DNA sequencing, where it just sequences from one end to the other end. This is sequencing a peptide in both directions. And once you realize that, things become a little bit more clearer. Um, and, you, and you start to understand why certain ions appear in certain places. Okay, so now that we've assigned these high mass ions, what we can start to do is we can start going and looking for uh, lower mass ions down at this end. We can start to assign these because what should happen is these ions down here should complement the, the ions that we find up here. Now, this is pretty old data. This comes from an iron trap. And because of the way that iron traps work, we don't typically see B1. So B1 would be the mass of isoleucine, which is 113, plus 1. And we, we, so we don't see 114 down here. So the next one up would be B2. That would be the mass of leucine or isoleucine plus the mass of valine plus 1. So if we do that, we're looking for 113 plus 99 plus 1. We get 213. There's that iron. And so we have this iron here, which is 
1238.6, which is the, the fragment through this bond here, and that is the mass of this end of the molecule, whereas this two, 213 is the mass of these two things. So you should be able to find both ends. Do you? Not always. So if we go looking for the next one up, so we, we now want to make sure that it's leucine, valine, valine. So it should be um, this mass plus another 99. That gives us 312. That's this iron here. Um, if we want to then figure out whether the phenylalanine is there, we add the mass of phenylalanine, we end up at 459, we confirm that one. So now what we're doing is we're finding ions from one end and confirming to the other end. And if we do this for the entire thing, we can start to assign the fragments to their particular bond and we can work out what the entire sequence of the peptide is. Now, you could do this for every single mass spectrum from data dependent acquisition that you acquire. But to do this with a piece of paper and a calculator and a mass table would take you about half an hour per spectrum. And when you've got hundreds of thousands of spectra, that becomes completely unrealistic. So what we do is we use database search engines. And so what we can do in that case is we can take a protein sequence database, and I mentioned this at the start of, the, uh, of this particular lecture. We can take those sequences and we can turn them into triptych peptides. Because we know the masses of the amino acids, we can work out the masses of the fragments, and we can make these theoretical spectra that don't have intensity values. We then take the acquired spectra and we compare this to all the theoretical ones. So what we can do is we can take the parent mass of the peptide and we can filter the database for only those masses. We then compare the MS spectra to the theoretical spectra and whichever has the most matching fragments goes to the top of the table and gets the highest score. Because you're now comparing numbers with numbers, you can actually calculate probability-based statistics on these things and look for how far outside the distribution, the probability distribution, your particular one is. How far away is it? And the further away the score is, the more likely it is to be significant. And therefore, the smaller this number is. This is an expectation value. It's analogous to a p-value. Anything smaller than 0.05 is significant. So you get a score and you get a significance value. And you can then decide the likelihood that this match is random is very, very low. Therefore, it is likely that it is this sequence and you end up calling it truth. Now, that's a lot about peptide fragmentation. I'm just going to step aside for a moment and talk about fragmentation of other mole molecules. So you can take lipids, which are singly charged, um, and um, you can uh, fragment them in different ways. So this is HCD fragmentation. You only really get one iron, whereas you do CID, um, you can get multiple different fragments. This particular case, we have this range of, uh, sorry, we have um, a fragmentation spectrum of this particular mass, and this particular mass matches all of these different triglycerides, but which one is it? And the way that you can do it in this case is you can take some of these fragments and you can do another round of mass spectrometry to be able to distinguish between which one of them there is. And in this particular case, it's this one. This can occur only in certain types of instruments that have iron traps on them, such as um, thermofusion tribrid instruments. Glycosylation is a little bit more difficult, um, where you end up with quite complicated spectrum, where you've got not only the peptide ions that are in there, but you also have ions for the different sugar groups, which are very labile and they get ripped off um, very easily. So you can figure out what the actual 
uh, composition of those sugars are, but it's a lot more difficult to figure out what's joined to what in what kind of antennae. So I'm not going to talk about that too much more. Um, there's plenty of really good reviews out there. Um, a particular one that comes to mind um, is called The Hitchhiker's Guide to Glycomics or Glycoproteomics. Um, so go and have a look at that. Okay, so collision-induced association has its problems. Typically, getting good information off glycosylations or other post-translational modifications is difficult because they tend to be labile. They tend to get smashed to pieces very easily um, when doing CID. So you often get good sequence of the peptide rather than good sequence of the post-translational modification. There are ways around this. I'm not going to go into it in this lecture. Um, the bigger the peptide or the higher the charge state, the more difficult it is to get comprehensive fragments. Instruments nowadays will adjust their collision energy once they measure and figure out the size and the charge state of the peptide, so it can be somewhat overcome. But there are other ways of doing this, and these are things like electron capture dissociation and electron transfer dissociation. So, All right, apologies for the pause. Um, I uh, went looking for that YouTube video because I forgot to open it and then, hang on. Found out that I didn't have that um, electron transfer dissociation video, so I had to go find it off a hard drive. So um, in electron transfer dissociation, what happens is that you get these fluoranthane ions transferring an electron to a multiply charged uh, peptide and what that does is it actually causes fragmentation so now what I'm going to do is um, I'll bring back up that uh, this animation that I have from Thermo um, and you'll have to excuse me I just have to restart it um, so here's the instrument and back here is the part that actually generates the fluoranthane ions. So here we have the ions in the trap um, and the voltages and the radio frequency. At the moment, when you ramp the RF voltage, you're going to eject different ions out of the trap. So you can see that um, as the radio frequency increases, the oscillation of some of the ions increases and the green ions get ejected out of the trap, the blue ions get ejected out of the trap, the red stay. Now what we do is we have the fluoranthane get injected. Um, so, well, firstly, we move the ions to the back end of the trap. We generate the fluoranthane ions. We bring them into the trap where the fluoranthane ions can then react with the protein and cause the fragmentation of the peptides. So here we they, they come together, you get that electron transfer reaction, you get fragmentation of the peptides into smaller fragments, you then ramp the RF voltage so that the different fragments get ejected from the trap at different times and therefore get detected as a mass spectrum. And this is what will be shown in this part of the video. If you were doing this on a fusion instrument, you could transfer these back to the... Um, you could transfer those ions back to the Orbi trap to measure them, uh, to measure their mass in the Orbi trap and get a much higher resolution um, uh, uh, mass spectrum. So it's different but complementary to collision-induced dissociation. The really great advantage is that um, different post-translational modifications are preserved and therefore can be localized to their amino acid. So if you've got a glycosylation, if you can get that glycosylated peptide into the iron trap, you can do that electron transfer dissociation 
um, and you get cleavage of the of the peptide backbone, but not of the post-translational modification, and you can measure that fragment um, to be quite large. Um, by the way, it's not just available on iron traps. You can get them on different beam uh, quadrupole TOF instruments. I know that Waters offer it as um, a, a bolt-on for their instruments. Um, it tends to work best on higher charge state peptides, and this has led to things like decision trees being made where the mass spectrometer decides on the fly if it's a 2 plus iron, you do CID. If it's a 3 plus or higher, you do ETD. Um, back when this slide was first written, the search algorithms weren't great, um, and they are probably better than they were. Um, and it is only available on some Thermo, some Brooker, and I believe some Waters instruments nowadays. So again, is there any point to me telling you this? Okay, so what I've basically tried to tell you in this, uh, in this video is how can we use mass spectrometry to identify what a biomolecule is? So what's the point, you're still thinking? Well, the point is that there's no analytical technique that can give you the level of information that chromatography coupled to mass spec can, with a few interesting caveats, especially when it comes to proteiform um, uh, measurements. It does have a really, really high level of sensitivity. It's got a massive dynamic range. You can do absolute and relative quanti quantification over that large dynamic range, and you can get immediate sequence information from the tandem mass spectrometry. The next lecture, we're going to start to talk about um, more applications and ways of actually generating data from these um, instruments. So uh, I will talk to you then.